Hey all you action figure enthusiasts out there, JC here and I'm back with another TNI interview for you guys. So last week's interview with Todd McFarlane was so successful that I decided I was going to try and continue this series. A lot of you have said you really like this type of content. And so for today, I'm going to be sitting down with Jerry Macaluso, which might not be a name quite as familiar to you as Todd McFarlane. He has worked in the industry for many years. He has had two of his own toy companies, plus he's just been a sculptor that's worked at other companies like Toy Biz, Hasbro, Mattel, Resaurus. And then before he even got into the toy industry, he uh, worked in Hollywood working on such movies like Toxic Avenger 2, Darkman, and, and Spawn. Now, the two companies that he started himself in the early uh, 2000s, late 90s, early 2000s was Soda Toys, which is probably best known for their Street Fighter action figures. So we talk a lot about that, what it was involved getting that off the ground. How did the Street Fighter figures come about? Which surprisingly, um, I, something I didn't know, it was actually the porn industry. Yes, the porn industry that helped kind of pave the way for those figures. And we talk about that in this video. And then also his second company, which is known as Pop Culture Shock. They're actually still around, but he has since sold his interest. He started that company, but he has since uh, sold his interest in that company. So he's no longer involved with it. But we also talk about, you know, why he started that company and, and, and all that as well. They focus more on statues and stuff. So if you're just straight up action figures, you might be less familiar with them. But, but they have definitely put out some pretty cool stuff over the years, including uh, more Street Fighter stuff, Mortal Kombat, Thundercats, um, things like that. So let's go on and jump into it. Gary, thanks for joining us today. I really appreciate you taking the time to sit down and talk with us. Um, you know, I know you've been working in the industry, both toy and you previously worked in Hollywood. So, you know, I'm really glad that you sat down so that we could kind of pick your brain about, you know, all of that stuff. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate it considering I'm, I'm, I'm not doing anything right now in the field. So, you know, I have uh, nothing to really promote and uh, not sure I'm relevant. Oh, I think I, I, I've listened to you talk on Facebook and stuff. So I would say you definitely have some good insights on things and stuff that I, I think the viewers will find uh, very interesting. Plus, I mean, there's just no deny. Even it's amazing to me. I mean, with your Street Fighter figures that you did with Soda, it, it's amazing to me that even by today's standards, I think they are, they still stand up uh, to the test of the time. The only company I think that's probably given your Street Fighter figures a run for their money is uh, Storm Collectibles, which is, you know, honestly, it's an, in, it's an overseas company. They're import figures. They cost a lot more. So I, I think it's that line, just what you accomplished with it back during that time, I think was amazing. I, I appreciate that. And, um, you know, I mean, I have to give a lot of credit also to, the, the people who were working at Soda at the time, like Will Hartbottle and Alexi Bustamante and uh, Adam Van Wickler um, and Jed Hay. They were all, you know, just as important to, to, to coming up with new ways to do things that we were trying to push that little bit of technology. But uh, uh, they are still fun. I, I dug some out the other day. And uh, it's, it's kind of cool that they'll, you know, they'll stand on one foot and, and toes and things like that. Um, I do have to, you know, give Storm a lot of credit. I own them. I buy them. Um, they're really good, the Storm figures. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm slightly jealous. But, uh, you know, it's also, you know, almost 20 years later. So uh, 15 years later. So uh, I wouldn't mind trying it again. Yeah, uh, well, well, that's actually going to – I don't want to jump ahead, but that was actually one of my questions uh, coming up. But um, also, speaking of Adam um, – when I put out that I was going to be talking to you on, on Facebook and, and looking for questions that maybe some of the viewers had, Adam, you wanted to know uh, who was an employee that you got into the most debates or, or squabbles with? Well, I mean, Adam, uh, I mean, without question, actually, I mean, <laughs> Adam's, Adam's passion for toys is at a level that I've never seen before or since. Um, he is, he's King toy to me. Um, and he, he makes us better, you know, I mean, he was constantly, you know, coming, coming in and saying, oh, we could do that better. We could do that better. And, and um, he has had fantastic ideas. And, yeah, he was, he was such an important part of it all. Now, do you find over the course of your time at Hollywood, which I want to get a little bit into and in the toy industry running your, your own company and stuff, was it difficult to put good people around you? Or did you find that to be, you know, one of the easier tasks in running a small business? 
it was it was a lot easier back then to find good people and honestly i'm not sure exactly why with pcs it was a it was a big challenge we went through a lot of people before we found the the right uh, uh combination that gelled and, and all worked together and, and allowed us to, to grow and go to the next step. But Soda Toys was interesting because it, it was almost like fate wanted Soda Toys to happen because no one was ever fired. I mean, Soda Toys, everyone we hired were amaz was amazing uh, at their job. And there were, there were never employee issues. I mean, it, Soda Toys was... It, it, it was like five years of, of heaven. It really was. Now, be, before you actually got into the toy industry, you worked in Hollywood. You did uh, makeup and special effects, right? Yes. And, and how did you actually end up in that genre? I, uh, like, like all of us probably, you know, I, I immersed myself in fantasy as, as a kid. And, you know, I loved Star Wars and everything else. Uh, but my favorite was Dark Crystal. And um, I saw making of Dark Crystal, you know, that was on HBO or something back in, you know, when it came out. And uh, until that time, it never really clicked with me. Um, I, I guess I was uh, 12, maybe. Uh, but it never clicked with me that people actually made those things. You know, I didn't know that that was something people could do. So after, after I saw the making of the Dark Crystal, that was my my obsession was to figure out how to make this stuff. And then I discovered Fangoria and magazine and Cinefax and Cinefantasty. And I, I happened to, I, I, I grew up in Fort Lauderdale at this time, and I happened to see on the news that they were shooting a really low budget horror movie called Scarecrows. And so my grandmother contacted the news station and said, how, you know, can, can I arrange for my grandson to go visit this, this movie? And uh, I didn't know about any of this at the time. She was trying to surprise me and um, arranged for me to go. And so I went and I met Norman Cabrera, who was doing the effects uh, on Scarecrows. And I volunteered to help for free. And so that was what I did. And I may have been 16 or just turned 17. Um, and so I just started to skip school <laughs> and I used to go to, to the Scarecrow's workshop every day, which was actually Norman's garage, I believe. Fangoria Magazine, or Troma, contacted Fangoria Magazine looking for someone to do the Toxic Avenger. I had been sending photos to Fangoria Magazine for a couple of years, and I think they printed a couple. And uh, so they gave Troma my contact info, and uh, Troma contacted me, and uh, I think I was 18, and uh, said... Uh, hey, come up to New York and we want you to do the Toxic Avenger. And I was like, oh, and this is part two. Uh, so I had already seen part one and I loved the first one. Uh, Jennifer Aspinall and Tom Lawton, I believe, to the original effects. And um, so I flew up to, they flew me up to New York and I did Toxic Avenger two and three. And, and from there, uh, it, you know, it was like, okay, well, I have to move to California. And both Rob Bottin and Steve Johnson said, um, well, if you come out here, you know, we'll give you, give you a job. And so that's what I did. I, I went out to L.A. as soon as I could. And it just, just kind of gelled from there. Working on Toxic Avenger, were you, like, obviously it was the sequel, but were you, like, kind of aware of the kind of following that movie would develop even years and years later? Um, or was it just kind of a, a, a cool monster movie that you were working on at the time? Well, the original already had a, a, I don't even want to call it a cult following because it was a new movie, um, but it had a following. And Fangoria was pushing it really hard. It was, it was a very popular movie. And I, and I really loved it. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't just because it was popular. It connected with me. I like, I've always liked humorous horror films, even though I don't really consider Toxic Avenger a horror movie. Um, it, it is kind of a horror movie. Um, but I like Evil Dead too is my favorite movie. So um, I like funny with my horror. And um, <clears throat> so, so to, to be able to redo that makeup that, you know, I'd only seen a year or two before when it was released was super exciting to me as, as, as a kid. Um, and, and truth is, I, I was not qualified to do that 
job, but they gave it to me anyway. Um, and, you know, the, the, the direction was basically to turn him into a marketable character. So I, you know, I started with the original design, of course, which is a fantastic design. And then I tried to, to make it more marketable. I, I don't know how else to put that, but um, I guess I succeeded because everything toxy after that, whether it's a cartoon or, or whatever, they've always followed my design, not the original design. So, so that's kind of cool. Would you say Toxic Avenger was your favorite movie that you did work on, or is there another one? Uh, well, throughout my entire career, my favorite thing was probably being the effects supervisor on the Weird Science TV show in the 90s. Everybody involved in that show was just wonderful to work with. Um, it was truly collaborative. Um, the budgets were, weren't the biggest, but they weren't too small either. I mean, it was, um, you know, Alan Cross was, was uh, kind of the, the, the father of, of that show, uh, writer, director, producer on that show. And uh, he's a huge nerd, uh, just like us. And so he, he, I, and my partner at the time, Roy Canaram, we would, we would just sit in the room and, and reference old movies and bounce stuff around and talk about Paul, Paul Blaisdell. Hey, can we make this monster look, look like this? Or, or, or also referencing newer things. Like, okay, we want to do, you know, our mini version of what, you know, of the Predator for the show on one-tenth the budget and one-tenth the time. Um, but yeah, Weird Science was, it was four years of like heaven, you know, plus we, we shot on the Universal lot. So it was my first time, uh, you know, being a regular on a, on a film stage and, and all. So that was, that was definitely the highlight. In hindsight, at the time, it was just a, a fun little job, which is Halloween Town. Um, at the time, it was a fun little job, but, you know, later on, it became, you know, this kind of uh, classic Halloween movie, like, like so many younger people grew up with Halloween Town now on Disney. Um, even my girlfriend, when, when, you know, I think she knew me for a year before she found out I did the effects on Halloween Town. <laughs> my God, you did Halloween Town? I was like, yeah. She said, everybody my age loves Halloween Town. But Toxie still, still holds, holds a, a big part of my heart simply because um, it's, it's persevered so long. And I met, you know, some of my best friends in the world on that show, and we're still close. Now, why, why did you decide to leave Hollywood and make the jump into the toy industry? You know, except for some really bright spots like Weird Science, uh, Halloween Town, for the most part, my career was doing hor like really bloody horror movies. Right. Uh, horns, Amityvilles, some of the Wishmasters, uh, things like that. And I'm not really a blood and gore fan. <laughs> so, um, you know, I mean, I have huge respect for Savinia when I was, you know, 17. I, I you know, I loved him to death. Um, but but it's, it's never been like my, my favorite thing, even though, you know, I say Evil Dead 2 is my favorite movie, but I don't consider it a gory movie. It's, it's just this hilarious fantasy thing to me. So uh, I always like sculpting and design the most, you know, and that comes from Dark Crystal being such a, an important part of my childhood and Henson's in general. I mean, Return to Oz, Labyrinth, uh, the Storyteller, it's everything and every they do at that time was absolutely amazing. So... McFarlane came out with the first wave of Spawn. And, you know, we didn't have a lot of money when I was a kid, so I didn't have a lot of toys. But I had a little bit of money at this point, so I started to buy the McFarlane figures, and I really thought they were super cool. You know, Todd, Todd was doing an amazing job. And um, I thought, gosh, you know, sculpting some of these toys would, would be fun. It'd almost be like sculpting film maquettes for a living, which, which was, at the time, you know, in the early 90s, Every sculptor in the film industry would just love to only sculpt film maquettes because that's the funnest part. You design it and sculpt it, and it's not too big, so you don't need people helping you. You can do it all by yourself. So um, I, I decided to just send pictures to the toy companies that were out there, McFarlane and, and Resource had just come on the scene and uh, Playmates and, and all that. So 
took a long time to find the, the addresses and the contacts, but eventually, you know, I did. And, and so I sent photos to all of them. All of them got back to me, which I did not expect. And I guess the allure of having effects artists sculpt for them, maybe they thought that helps in marketing at that time or something, you know? But I was, I was suddenly being offered toy jobs. I mean, it, it, it really required no effort other than sending some resumes and, and photos. Um, and then the jobs started coming in. And the crazy thing was, I didn't have a clue how to do articulation. I'm not an at all. Um, and, and no one really, you know, other than saying, hey, can you figure out how to do the articulation? And I'd say, yeah, I can figure it out. I mean, you know, I, I was friends with machinists and stuff like that because of the effects company. And, and so we did. I mean, it took a long time. I mean, I think the first sculpture I did was for Resaurus, and it was for Duke Nukem. Um, and I forget the name of the character, but it was this big four-armed lizard guy with a Gatling gun uh, for Duke Nukem. It was, it, was a, it was a decent budget because I thought it would only take a week. Well, it took six weeks because <laughs> no idea how to do this articulation. And I was not about to show it to them until it worked. That was the beginning. And once that job happened and once they liked it, Resource started funneling so much work to me that I had to start pulling our sculptors from the effects side of the, the company to this new little toy thing. And the thing was, the toy thing actually paid better. So everybody wanted to work on the toys. Nobody wanted to work on the effects stuff anymore. <laughs> you know, it got to the point where by 97, 98, um, the toy thing was bringing in so much more money than the effects company. And most of the effects company jobs were just not that interesting. It was another bad slasher movie like Uncle Sam. Um, you know, that, that I just wasn't interested in doing it at all, the effects stuff. So I decided to focus on the toy thing full time. And my partner Roy took over the effects stuff full time. And um, once, I, once I dedicated myself to the toy thing full time, it exploded. Soda, it was called Soda Sculpture and Design. It wasn't called Soda Toys. And Soda Sculpture and Design, I mean, I had 20 sculptors like wow. going all the time. Uh, we had so much toy work. I know like you're credited for working at company or doing work for companies like Mattel, Hasbro, Toy Biz. Now, was that you specifically or is that just you, your company uh, was doing work for those companies? I, I was the only sculptor for probably the first year or so, maybe longer. Um, but the first person I hired the sculpts I believe it was Michael Norman, who then went, he was my key person at Soda Toys, or not at Soda Toys, so he, he ended up being basically the, the head sculptor for Soda Sculpture and Design. And he left to go to Gentle Giant right before I started Soda Toys. So, so he, he had his hand in most things, uh, but... Uh, but there are certain things that, you know, at the beginning I did do myself, the Toy Biz stuff, Silver Surfer, Beta Ray Bill, I did those myself that I did for those. I did some, some stuff for, I think it was Playmates, for uh, uh, the Batman movie with Arnold. Um, there, there was a lot of stuff back there before I had anybody that I did do myself. Uh, the first few resource figures, once things got rolling, there was no way to, to do it all myself. So... The sculptors that I hired at that time to give people credit. Um, so Michael Norman was probably the first. Alexi Bustamante was was very early on. Eric Sosa, I gave him his first toy job. Uh, a bunch of people who who are now names in the toy industry, you know, considered top top toy designers and sculptors. Now, how much direct input did you have on, on that type of thing, being you were kind of like a, an outside contractor doing these things? Was it just like they send it to you and said, make this happen? Or did you, were you allowed input on how the figure was and appeared and everything like that? Or yeah. did you even have like a choice of characters you could do, like say for Marvel, you know, could you pick the characters you want or was it something they basically just assigned to you? Sometimes there was a choice of characters, but, but more than often... Um, I would just take everything. 
Um, I had a, a nice group of really talented people. So I knew we could handle it. And we were all young and we were all willing to work 15 hour days, seven days a week to make these cool toys. So, so I, I don't recall ever turning anything down, to be honest. It was that standard practice back then for the big toy companies to hire basically outside, you know, bring in outside contractor type deals for their sculpting, or were you kind of a unique case in regards to that? The, the big toy companies, um, most of them had in-house sculptors, but uh, they didn't have a lot. And a lot of the in-house sculptors, from what I, I understand, uh, they were doing, uh, they would get stuff in from outside, sculptors and they do little little touch-ups or you know uh, change some things to to make it exactly what the product manager wants this and that um we would follow the art pretty closely the, the place where they gave us freedom was to say you know and this was because of todd mcfarland you know they would say you know put, put as much mcfarland detail into it as possible so so the, the basic designs uh would would all be drawn out in turnarounds and then we would you know we would just trick out the the details now i could definitely see a a company like a resource wanting that kind of thing like the mcfarland style but were you getting that same kind of feedback from the hasbros and and the mattels and stuff too were they at that time really looking as the adult collector or were they still more focused on the kids mostly focused on the kids uh toy biz which we, we didn't do a whole lot for toy biz i mean we did we did the right Rise of the Silver Surfer stuff. We did um, some Lord of the Rings pieces, some wrestling. Um, there's a few more, but Toy Biz was definitely not one of the bigger clients for us. Toy Biz was, you know, tied in with Digger uh, from Art Asylum. And uh, so most stuff, Toy Biz went to, went to Digger. So we probably got the stuff that that he was just too too busy to do from Toy Biz. Um, we did a lot for uh, applause. Um, there was a company called Equity at the time, and uh, they started doing a bunch of cartoon stuff, and including Scooby Doo. So they had the Scooby Doo license. We did a ton of that, a ton of Scooby Doo, and that all had to match turnarounds exactly. You know, anything that was really strictly child targeted had to match those turnarounds but then um but even you know but even toy biz like on the lord of the rings stuff you know it, it i think it was it wasn't 100 percent targeted to kids so they allowed us to go in and put as much detail as we could on the lord of the rings stuff that we did Obviously, you decided to go into business for yourself and start doing your own toys. And as I understand it, that's in large part because of Capcom and Street Fighter that you were originally doing the sculpting for, I, I think it was Palisades, and, and for whatever reason that fell through. So you ended up doing it yourself. Um, can you kind of walk us through just like what it was like taking on as your is your own company taking on a license like Street Fighter? And, you know, how did you decide to go the highly articulated route as opposed to the more statuesque McFarlane type figures? Um, there actually was a stage for Soda Toys before Street Fighter where we failed. So I think it was 99. We got the license. This is, uh, uh, so it was, I owned Soda Sculpture and Design. Michael Norman was, was the head, head of sculpture. And then Vincent Doni was the, basically the business run, ran the business side and they approached me and said, let's make our own stuff. I was like, I, I, we can't afford that, blah, blah, blah. They said, no, no, we'll start small with something, you know, resin or something that's not too expensive, one little license. And they pitched me on doing Planet of the Apes mini busts. <laughs> Vince happened to know the lady at, at uh, Fox who handled Planet of the Apes. Her name was Kathleen and uh, uh, super nice lady. And uh, so he, he contacted her. And remember, this was before all these studios saw these, these collectibles as big money. Right. So, so she gave us a license for nothing, nothing up front. She said, okay, we like your guy's stuff. Go make some Planet of the Apes mini busts. And we did, and we prototyped them. We got a factory in China, thanks to a couple people at Resaurus who, who gave us some contact info, which they probably shouldn't have because their bosses wouldn't have liked it at the time. But I can't <laughs> remember Ken Lilly or, or uh, Jay and Chris Borman, but maybe three of them. But um, they gave us 
a contact at a factory in China. And so we got these mini busts made and they didn't sell at all. Nobody bought those Planet Apes mini busts. I think we did an entire, the entire run was like 800 pieces or something split up between three SKUs. So, you know, I lost money on that and I was like, okay, we're not doing this anymore. <laughs> so that was the, the first venture. And so then it was a couple of years before uh, Mark Mostman contacted us about uh, taking over Street Fighter. So what happened there is, well, I don't actually know the story on Palisades end, other than Palisades was, was doing the project. We were going to sculpt on it. And uh, something didn't, happen, didn't work out. And, and Palisades and Capcom, their deal fell apart. And um, Mark called me and said, if you were going to sculpt these anyway, why don't you just make them? And I said, you know what that costs? I don't have that kind of money. Right around when that conversation happened, um, I guess I skipped something, which was the, the Adult Superstars action figures. The Adult Superstars was able to fund the Street Fighter figures. Wow. Uh, if it wasn't for the money from the Adult Superstars, no way could we have afforded to ever try to make Street Fighter. Yeah, I was going to ask, how did you end up doing action figures based on porn stars? So uh, my girlfriend at the time was a porn star, and uh, she was friends with Jenna. And uh, I had become friendly with Jenna's husband, Jay. And um, we, we were at dinner, and um, I, I pitched her, you know, just doing one figure of her. And the inspiration was actually Clay Moore stuff, uh, because at that time, Clay was doing just amazing uh, female action figures. They didn't really have articulation, uh, maybe you know a couple swivels at the, the shoulders, but they were really beautiful. And they were this wonderful combination of uh, I don't know I don't know cartoony is the right word, but but they weren't completely real, but they weren't like super cartoony either. They were they, Clay's just amazing. I can never say enough good things about Clay. So I was so inspired by that. I thought wow, what if, you know, we have a Jenna figure that looks like one of these Claymore figures, same scale and everything else. So at dinner one day, I just pitched it to her and she was, she was right, right into it. I mean, there was no further conversation. She's like, yeah, let's do it. Um, so we worked out a deal and I thought, okay, this is just one figure. I can, I can figure out how to pay, because steel tooling in China and all, it's very expensive. I, right. I figure out how to pay for that, that one figure, you know, not a line. And um, that one figure, it's funny because I had a very clear vision of what I wanted. I wanted to like claim more stuff, but Jenna kind of pushed it into a little bit more of a cartoony direction. Um, so I don't think anybody was quite happy with how that first figure came out, but it sold tens of thousands of pieces, wow. containerfuls to different countries. I mean, you know, Germany would buy 20,000 pieces or something like that. And we priced it super high too. It was it was a twenty dollar figure when when the other collectible figures were twelve, I think, at that time. Mm -hmm. Twelve maybe. So we were super expensive. Uh, but it sold like crazy. I, I remember back because I was just starting out with, with the website and I remember you guys would send us press images and, and, and materials for those figures and it was like I wanted to cover them because they were action figures and I mean, you know, we primarily deal with the adult action figure collector community but i also knew that there would be kids that were coming on so it was always like how do i cover it because you would like send us you would send us the clothes figures and then there were the naked figures too and it was like so i always thought that was funny but it's yeah. amazing those sold that much so like crazy and, and of course you know um as with a lot of successful businesses um there was luck involved it was the right Thing at the right time. Jetta got her e-show, I think she got her e-show right after we did this deal, even before the figure came out. So, you know, I mean, nobody knew that was going to happen. Nobody, she was already famous, but nobody knew she was going to become like a, a really famous, like a real celebrity. Uh, and she did. And, and you know, uh, I believe Jay Leno had the figure on, his, on the Tonight Show. I know Stern had it on. Um, <laughs> and I refused to do it because I was like, all he's going to do is make fun of me and make me feel like an idiot. So, so I didn't do it. Um, but uh, yeah, um, that was, it was just, it was totally unexpected. Nobody, nobody saw that coming. 
And that's what, what funded Soda Toys getting off the ground. Now, did you, with those figures, did you actually get to interact with the actual stars or was it all based on like pictures and things like that? Oh no, they, they all came by. Um, everybody came by, then we would take them over. There was a company at the time, there were only two companies in LA doing full body scans of, of people. And that was Gentle Giant and Cyber Effects. But I didn't want to go to Gentle Giant because you know, Carl, the owner of Gentle Giant and I were still young. And so we still had this kind of competitive arrogance to us. And so no way was I gonna go to Carl to do scanning for my product. So we took the girls to gentle, or to Cyber Effects. Uh, I forget his name, the guy who owns it, his name's Dick. I don't remember his last name. But um, he had the same basic equipment that Carl did. So we did full body scans of all the girls. And some of them, you know, in and out real quick. But some of them were really fascinated by the whole thing and the art. And, and uh, a lot of the girls, um, like Kylie Ireland and... Uh, uh, God, it's been so long, I can't remember names. But a lot of them loved it so much, they would come by the studio every so often just to see how things were going. Um, and, and yeah, they would just hang out all day. Um, so we became, we became pretty friendly with, with a lot of them. So, so that paid for the, you, the, paid and paved the way for the Street Fighter. So how, how did you, like, obviously you had mentioned earlier that when you started with the action figures, you really weren't that familiar with articulation. So, and obviously if McFarlane was kind of a, a, a inspiration for you, I mean, McFarlane, especially back then was not known for articulated figures. So yet your figure, your street fighter figures are very much on par with like, you know, the, the Marvel legends of the time um, and such. So how did you kind of, why did, I mean, I think it was a brilliant idea, but why did you decide to go that route with the highly articulated figures as opposed to the more statuesque type figures for that line? Um, it actually started because of Tomb Raider. So right before I accepted the Street Fighter license, I accepted the Tomb Raider license, uh, the Angelina Jolie movie. Uh, and it was the second movie, not the first movie. Um, and, uh, and she had chose us. She had seen the adult superstar figures. And she told the licensing agent at the studio, Paramount, I want these guys to do the new creator figures. Those porn so, figures really uh, worked out well. <laughs> they're, they're kind of the key to everything. <laughs> um, so, so we did a deal to do the, the Tomb Raider figures. But what, what wasn't passed on to me was the information that Angelina Jolie wanted to look real, like adult superstars or, or like McFarlane. Like she didn't, she didn't want to be a fully articulated toy, but I didn't know that. And we thought, well, Tomb Raider, it's a movie, you know, we should do, we should do articulated because it might have crossover to kids and, and so make them articulated. Angelina did not like the prototype oh, at no. all. <laughs> this, this looks like a toy. This isn't what I wanted. But we didn't know, and there was no time. We had to hit the movie release. There was no time to redo them, so we went with it. And the pre-sales were so good that that. And at this time, before the before Tomb Raider came out, we had, we did the deal for Street Fighter. But the Tomb Raider pre-sales were so high, we were like, "Well, we got to do Street Fighter this way. That let's let's not do Street Fighter statue way. Let's do Street Fighter fully articulated. But if we're going to do it fully articulated," let's let's try to push it let's try to you know do it as as good as anyone's ever done it and so that's where michael norman whom i mentioned several times in the past really stepped in because he was a huge articulation geek i was more of the mcfarlane guy he was more of the toy biz guy um so he really designed a lot of the articulation in in the street fighter figures yeah because i mean i've got yeah, you know, these figures, I mean, like, this is one of your, your Guile figure, and, I mean, these joints, even today, and, I mean, I got this figure when it first came out, and this figure has been, you know, through the ringer, it's been posed, it's been packed up in boxes, and, I mean, the joints are still tight, and, uh, you know, even, like, the paint is, like, you know, near perfect, I mean, you wouldn't tell this figure is, like, 
close to 20 years old. I mean, it's, it's, it's amazing the quality of, of these figures. Um, even the Toy Biz Marvel Legends don't, I think, hold up quite as well as, as, as these figures. So and my hat's yeah. off for you guys uh, really doing. We basically told the factory to whatever it costs to make them as high as quality as possible. And we would just price them based on what the factory told us. So at that time, I think, you know, a typical action figure of, of that scale at the factory was probably costing maybe a buck 30, maybe a buck 50 um, at the factory level. Our figures were anywhere from 220 to three bucks. So they cost us a lot more to make than, than most anyone else was, was spending at that time. Um, and so I believe, I believe we started at fourteen ninety nine, which was high for the, for the time. And our profit margins weren't that big on the Street Fighter stuff, but we hoped to make it up in volume because you know uh, we thought you know we were really going to inject some life into the the license. Well, I think you did because I mean I don't I mean there have been companies before you guys and after you guys that have tried to take on the Street Fighter action figure license and i don't think like you know other than storm collectibles which you know is an import company i i, I don't think anyone's been successful in doing that um even like you know neca toys tried to do street fighter for a little while there and i don't think it worked for them that well so i mean it was just take i mean i know everybody knows street fighter you know so it, obviously street fighter is a well-known name but i'm not sure that necessarily translates to action figures you know a lot of times properties like that don't necessarily always transfer to popular action figures but but you know just like i said the quality and everything and i don't i don't remember them being that much more expensive than say like a marvel legends maybe a little bit but i don't really remember i mean maybe i'm just by today's standards thinking today's standards but i, I don't really remember them being way overpriced over over what your com competitors were doing at the time yeah, I, I mean, I think it was only a couple bucks, but at that time, a couple bucks was, was a big deal, especially to retail, because I remember, you know, retail pushing really hard, uh, and I remember us meeting with Toys R Us, and Toys R Us wouldn't carry them unless we brought the price down, but, but our margins were already too, too small. We couldn't bring the price down because of how much we were paying, um, so that's why they never got to, to Toys R Us. Uh, part, of the, part of the reason the thing was a success is Capcom let us do our thing you know it was a company full of very talented people who all loved street fighter all loved action figures were collectors ourselves and capcom just let us do it i mean they they really didn't butt in at all so that was that was a big big key part of it you mentioned NECA street fighters i know that you know when when randy and those guys did street fighter 4 um capcom was just it was their baby the new game and they were just very nitpicky about what everything had to be and and um i think that was a part of, of reason why the line didn't go on too far yeah i was gonna actually say i i've heard like a lot of i don't want to say horror stories but a lot of like people have had to deal with the capcom licenses you know say that it's not always the easiest company to work with but but you, you seem to have had a much better relationship with them than yeah they because i i i I believe I'm the longest, uh, I mean, I don't have it anymore since I sold PCS, but I believe uh, I've held the Street Fighter license for the longest amount of time out of any, any company. Uh, and I, I mean, you know, made so many Street Fighter products that um, Capcom generally left me alone a lot. Um, it started to change when Street Fighter V came out. They started to get super nitpicky, even with me at that time. And that resulted in, in certain certain products not being what I wanted them to be. But um, I mean, it's their it's their property. I can't, you know, how bad can I argue with them? They own it. Now you had a few other uh, properties that you it's it's soda that you tried to get off the ground. That like I know, like in particular, Micronauts was one that you were really hopeful was going to take off, and unfortunately didn't seem to. And then um, even uh, Dark Stalkers was another one that I think a lot of people were looking forward to, and of course didn't actually end up getting released. What, what happened with with those? What why why did you hit? Um, 
that snags with those particular lines? So Micronauts was my passion project. Micronauts is my favorite thing in the whole world. I've got an arm full of Micronauts. <laughs> you know, um, I, I own every Micronaut ever made. I have like, there's only two mint in box USA Ampzillas in the world. I have one of them. It's my thing. I love Micronauts. Um, and so uh, Ken Abrams, um, whose dad is Marty Abrams, who was Migo, uh, and, and basically, you know, released the Micronauts into the U.S. and created my childhood. Um, <laughs> I, I became friends with, I don't remember how I became friends with Ken, actually, but, um, you know, he knew my passion for Micronauts, and he, he wanted to see Micronauts come back, and so did I. So we did a deal, and we basically developed no, like, cost no object Micronaut prototypes. We were like, okay, let's just do the, what we think are the ultimate Micronaut figures that stay true to the past, but still bring them a little bit into, you know, bring them into now. Uh, let's give them McFarlane detail, but toy biz articulation. Let's, like, let's just try to reinvent action figures. Whether we succeed or not, whole different question. But that was our intent. And we worked on those things forever, revision after revision, not because anyone was asking us to, just because we wanted to please ourselves. And when, you know, we showed them at Toy Fair, the reaction was fantastic. Uh, even Toys R Us was, was in. They were like, okay, we're in. Then we got served with a lawsuit from Japan, from Takara, who, you know, I'm sure most of your, your viewers will be familiar with Takara, Microman. Right. Uh, with, the genesis of Micronauts. So Takara was suing, uh, saying that uh, Marty Abrams uh, had no right to be able to license to us the Micronauts. And, you know, we're a small company. Um, we can't fight a, a giant Japanese company in a lawsuit. We don't right. have that kind of um, So our attorney said, just drop the line. And Marty said, don't drop the line. We'll pay your lawyer fees. And I was stuck between that. I was stuck between our attorney saying, no, drop it. And Marty saying, I'll pay the lawyer fees. Turns out I should have listened to Marty. I listened to my lawyer. We dropped the line. A year later, maybe, maybe a little longer, Marty won the lawsuit. So, you know, but by, maybe it was two years later. Because by that time, I was selling my share of Soda Toys. Right. If I was still Soda Toys... I would have picked it back up and kept going at that time, even though Marty was pissed at me. Uh, but <laughs> you gotta listen to your lawyer, what are you gonna do? So the new owner of Soda Toys just didn't, didn't wanna- uh, Pull with it. Pull with it. it was, he didn't care about Micronauts. Micronauts was my thing, you know? Um, and that leads right into Darkstalkers. Because it was the same with Darkstalkers. Uh, it wasn't that I canceled it. I think Darkstalkers would have done fantastic. The new owner of Soda Toys canceled it. Um, <laughs> So that's what, what happened with Darkstalkers. Those prototypes for Darkstalkers were some of the most amazing prototypes I ever saw in my life. And, you know, other than being the art director, I can't take credit for them. They were Will Harbottle's baby, uh, who now, Will is like uh, uh, one of the top sculptors at Sideshow, maybe even the head of sculpture, I don't know. But um, that was Will's, Will, Will just I knocked that out of the park. And then Kat, his wife, painted them and... She's like the best painter in the world, I think. Um, so yeah, they just kicked butt on those Darkstalkers figures. Now, now, why did you decide to sell off uh, your your part of Soda Toys? I mean, it seemed like Soda was kind of at the top of their game, and you seemed to be enjoying yourself overall. So, wh why did you decide to kind of get out of the game at that point? Well, here's here's where my mentioning of our attorney comes comes into play. Um, because our attorney was also my business partner. I was the key to all the art side and he was the key to the business side. Um, and um, the business side wasn't going as well as I thought it was. Um, there, were, there were a bunch of issues I, 15 years ago, so I don't remember the details. So we, we were not getting along anymore. He was complaining that I was spending too much money and we needed to tighten our budgets and, and be more like other companies. And I was young, arrogant, and I was like, we're not going to be like other companies. So why even bother to do it? You know, if we're not going to be the best, 
And he's like, well, because then we have to pay our mortgages and stuff. That's why we're going <laughs> to. But I didn't see things like that. You know, I was I was still in my, I don't know, what was I 35 maybe? Um, and uh, I was also producing a movie at the time. So, you know, I'm also thinking, well, I don't need this hassle. I'm making a movie and I'm going to make more movies. And, uh, you know, my partner's being a, a jerk, blah, blah, blah. The truth is in the middle. Yeah. Neither Neither was for wrong. The truth is in the middle. Um, so he secretly, without my knowing, and I can talk about this now because not the non-disclosure is long, long gone. Uh, he was negotiating with one of our factories in China to have the factory buy the company, the complete company. Wow. Um, and so one day I came into the office and uh, he sit, we sat down in the conference room to go over some stuff. And he said, um, you know, I've got, I've got news. Uh, the company is being sold. I was like, what are you talking about? The company's being sold. And, and he owned 50%. So the thing is, he, either of us could kind of kill the deal or lock the deal. Like, you know, I can't do anything without his approval. He can't do anything with my approval. And he said, look, you know, oh, we're going to run out of money in four months. So if we don't sell it now, um, we're just going to not have anything in, in a few months. And that's when I learned that uh, one of our factories, the biggest factory we were using in China, had gone out of business. Um, and we didn't know. He didn't know either. I don't want to blame him. But my partner didn't know either. We found out way later because they just, they were placating us when we were asking, or he was asking for updates. They would say, Oh yeah, yeah. We'll get you some pictures next week. We'll get, and this went on for months and months and months and months. And uh, they had they had a bunch of stuff like the 18 inch darkness, and uh, they were doing a bunch of stuff. So he knew before me, but not that much before me, that there were all these problems in China. Um, and uh, the same factory screwed other companies over too. They are one of the factories that helped put Palisades out of business. They're going under because wow. we were both the same factory. I basically felt I had no choice but to sell it to the, the Chinese company that owned another factory we were working with. They didn't want me or him to have anything to do with it. They just, you know, wanted to get their foot in the door with all these distributors and stuff like that. Um, so I agreed to, to sell, sell my half. So I guess, I guess you weren't too surprised that shortly after that, soda basically was no more. I don't know if I was surprised or not. Um, on one hand, I, I guess I was surprised because why buy a company if you're not going to use it? Right. I still don't quite understand why they bought it because they changed the Street Fighter line, which was successful to something that was different. Um, but um, yeah, uh, I, that th it surprised me that they changed everything because our sales were fine. Um, the products were great. The sales were fine. The problem was, was twofold. One was the factory going under and two was tower records and music land, both going bankrupt at the same time. And they owed sort of toys, hundreds of thousands of dollars, not quite mil a million, but, but close to a million dollars between the two of them. So yeah, I, I, uh, I, I don't understand why, they, uh, they didn't continue with the lines that were successful. The Lovecraft line, uh, there were three characters in the Lovecraft line. You know, only the Cthulhu really sold. Um, mm -hmm. But the Cthulhu, it was selling like crazy. And it was something you could have sold every year because it's not licensed. It's iconic. It's evergreen. Every year, you know, for Halloween or whatever, you're going to sell 10,000 Cthulhus. So why not keep making them? It was just, it, the whole thing was bizarre. And I've never quite quite understood what happened behind the scenes after I sold. Well, so then you obviously took a little bit of a break, but then decided to get back into things with pop culture shock. So what was the thinking there? And obviously you kind of changed gears a bit because instead of doing action figures, you really focused on the statues. Um, so what, what brought you back to the business? And then why did you decide to go the statue route as opposed to action figures again? I thought I was done with the toy business after soda. 
we, we, the, the one movie I had made, I had produced, Night Skies, uh, was done, and we were lining up funding for some other movies. And I thought that's what I was going to focus on. Um, but two things happened. Uh, one, the funding for, for the other movies kept getting delayed and delayed and delayed. And I didn't, I didn't make, uh, you know, I didn't get rich off of selling soda, but I was, I was able to live a few, a couple of years, you know, without, without working, trying to get this, these other movies done. But eventually, um, you know, I started to think, well, I'm going to have to do something for money. What should I do? And at the same time, Mark Mosman, uh, contacted me and said, again, from Capcom, right? Yes. Um, and Mark was like, why don't, why don't you do Street Fighter statues? And uh, my guy, I don't know. I don't want to get back into that. And, you know, and in the, in, in the stat, I saw the toys, we released some uh, resin statues, but they never sold really well. Like resin just was not something that was doing really well for us. But between that time and, and this new period, Sideshow sales had really blown up, and, you know, in a good way. And, and, you know, statues were coming into the forefront for customers, authors. And, you know, I was like, I, I just don't have it in me to deal with all this by myself, you know, factoring, you know, manufacturing, sales, distribution. Like, he said, no, 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 no. Let Sideshow do it all. You just design them, sculpt them, and, and let Sideshow take care of it. And I was like, well, why would Side? I mean, he said, I already talked to Sideshow. I was like, really? He said, I put this whole thing together for you. It's already done. I was like, yeah. And so he, he arranged a meeting with Sideshow. And uh, I met with Sideshow. And Sideshow was like, yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. And, and so that's how PCS got, got started. Now, I remember uh, there was a time, even though Pop Culture Shock primarily focused on the statues, you um, did, did, you know, dabble your a bit in the action figures 12 inch action figures as i recall uh with sons of anarchy i think you got a few of those released and then you were going to do street fighter but i don't think those ever got released um can you talk about why you were going back into the action figure area and what, what happened with that uh i'm a big hot, hot toys fan you know like everybody else um i really love what hot toys was doing and and i like to challenge myself I wanted to see could could I make figures as well as Hot Toys. <clears throat> I was also at the time a big Sons of Anarchy fan. The show was still on the air, and um, I um, I went to Fox, and my friend Josh Izzo was the licensing person at Fox, so that was easy. And I said I wanted to Sons of Anarchy, you know, Hot Toys style, and so the deal was put together. It was very very easy. However. Um, the last season of Sons of Anarchy was coming up and um, developing the Hot Toys style figure to, to, a, to that level of quality was just way more challenging than I thought it was going to be. I mean, we, we ended up, uh, we went through so many sculptors. Um, we ended up, uh, for the costuming, I mean, we tried to hire people local uh, in, in LA, um, we went through several, several people, months and months of development. They couldn't get the costumes right. We eventually located um, one of the Hot Toys, uh, one of the places that Hot Toys uses to, used at that time to develop six scale costumes in Korea. And so I finally talked to them and they, they were like, yeah, we'll do it, but we're booked up for the next six months and it'll take about four months even after we start. So we're looking at a year. And the new show was about to start, or the last season was about to start. So, the, you know, the decision was, do we just cancel it? Because there's no way they'll ever come out while the show is still on the air. Or do we just go through with it knowing that the sales aren't going to be good because the show's not on the air? But at least I'll learn the process. So I decided to go through with it. I was like, I've got to learn the process of what goes into making these, you know, 12 inch figures. Um, eventually the prototypes looked good. They weren't quite Hot Toys quality, but they were better than, I think they were better at that time, they were better than anything else on the market other than Hot Toys. Uh, I think they were, you know, a little bit better than 
sideshows 12 inch and, and stuff like that. So, um, so I, I was happy with that, but I knew because we weren't as good as Hot Toys, we had to price them low enough that collectors understood that we understood they aren't quite as good as Hot Toys. You know, we're not gonna charge you 250 bucks because we know they're not as good. So we priced them at 180 bucks, which I thought was, you know, fine. We, which we only made like 30 bucks uh, on each piece at that price. So we, we were gonna lose money because we weren't gonna sell enough to even cover the tooling and stuff. But again, I felt I had to do it because I had to learn how to do it. The only way to learn is to do it. So I, I looked at it as like paying for school. So, so, you know, we got those made. It came out two years after the last season of, of Sons of Anarchy. Uh, they didn't sell well. I think maybe 500 of each character. So they'll probably be worth money someday. Um, so that's a pretty, pretty low run. And out of those, uh, uh, most of them were the regular in the, because the exclusive version came with like all sorts of weapons, like, like 10 different guns and, and stuff like that. And those, I think we only did maybe a hundred of each skew. But I, I enjoyed the process and, and I was proud enough of how they came out that I thought we could do more. And now that I had done it, I thought I could do it better. I already knew, now I knew, I knew who to hire to sculpt the heads. I knew who to hire to do the costumes. I knew which factory. So all that stuff was already done. And that was the hard part. So we went and, and we asked Capcom, can we do Street Fighter 6 scale? They said, yeah, sure, okay. Um, so there was that. We also got the license to Alice Cooper. We got the license to The Thing. We got the license to American World in London. Oh, Legend, we were going to do a six scale darkness. We sculpted it too. Nobody's ever seen it though. The Street Fighter one ended up being so much more difficult than I thought because, you know, with Sons of Anarchy, they're covered in costume. So the body, I mean, it has to be a good body, it has to work, it has to have tight joints, but um, it doesn't have to look good without clothing. Street Fighter bodies have to look good naked but I didn't want them to look like a giant Marvel Legends. I didn't want them to look like an action figure. I wanted them to look more, I wanted to hide the articulation as much as possible, but still give it a lot of articulation. Right. So we screwed around with lots of soft, thin parts, uh, skins that would go over the articulation. So most of it would be, it. Renee Aldretti sculpted the very first body. Uh, and it was good. It was great, actually. Uh, there was nothing wrong with it from a technical aspect, but from a sculptural, from a design aspect, I just wanted to change some things. Uh, so we printed it, we 3D printed it, we cast it in wax, and then I noodled on it uh, for a while. We molded it, blah, blah, blah. I think we rescanned it so that we would have a digital file. Um, then, started this very long R&D process of trying to hide the articulation better. So we would 3D print it, move it around, redesign some stuff. And, you know, it went on for years, for like two years. Yeah, because I remember you had some prototypes on display at one of the conventions, San Diego or something one year. With the um, right. I can't remember what, there, there's three, there were three generations and we showed them three different years. I can't remember. One year was at WonderCon, one year San Diego. But the, the first generation, not happy with it all. Second generation was better. The third generation was perfect. It was ready to go to the factory. But that was right around when I decided to sell a company. So uh, why they didn't pursue it after I sold it, I don't know. I don't, I don't talk to them, so I, I couldn't answer that. But, but by the time I left, that figure was, was pretty much ready to go. Well, like you had mentioned before, like how you had a desire to want to create a Hot Toys quality 12-inch figure. And obviously you tried, but came up a little bit short. Do you, do you think, well, first of all, do you think that it is, after what you learned and everything with those 12-inch figures, do you think it is possible for a U.S.-based company to put out that quality of a figure? Um, or do you think that's the market's just not here in this country for that type of thing? I mean, it's possible. The problem is um, nobody from, from here wants to live in China. And that's what you have to do. 
to get that kind of quality, you have to be on the ground at the factory at least a couple times a week for the entire duration of the project. And, and people don't, don't want to do that. And, and I didn't want to do that. Um, but that's the only way to do it. And if like somebody came to you, like another company and said, Hey, we, we loved what you did with street fighter. Um, would you come work for us and, and launch a new soda esque street fighter type line? W would that be something that interested you? I don't, you? I don't think I could do better than storm right now. I mean, well, the thing about storm is they're just so much more expensive. I mean, they go are like 80 bucks a piece. So, uh, I mean, if you, I know what it takes to do that level of quality. And even they have some, I mean, I, I buy them all. And sometimes, you know, they break right out of the package, just like toys do. Um, but um, yeah, I don't, the only thing I'd be interested in is one six because no one's done it well. I mean, a couple places have tried and they've been horrible. Um, I, you know, I, I'd probably be interested in doing one six. And that's not like some weird hint. I'm not working on Street Fighter one six or anything. Awesome. Uh, Did you, was that like, I mean, I, a lot of times people when they think street fighter they also think mortal Kombat. did you was there ever a time i mean I, and obviously you did do mortal Kombat statues with pop culture shock was there ever a time where you thought about trying to do what you did with street fighter do it the, the same thing with mortal Kombat? no uh actually uh and i i love mortal Kombat. um but um no uh you know um back at soda um, we really wanted to move into original stuff. We, we wanted to be me. I wanted to be McFarlane. You know, I wanted it to, I wanted people to want my original figures. So we were, we were looking less and less into licenses and more into uh, original stuff being developed. At PCS, I actually developed a line of original action figures because I was so inspired by the Four Horsemen. Um, and, um, you know, the stuff... Their original figures are just like mind-blowingly good. Uh, and so I was inspired. So I actually had a sculptor on staff, David Assel, um, and that's all he worked on was my pet project. Uh, and we got it all sculpted up, but then I sold the company. But that actually retains with me. I still own that original line. That was part of our deal. So, I mean, if I, if I ever had someone who wanted to, to fund it, I put it into production. It's really cool. David did an amazing job on it. And Emilio uh, Santa Lucia, uh, do you know who that is? Masters of the Universe? Uh, yeah, he designed them. Uh, so Emiliano designed them, David sculpted them, and uh, I still got, I own that, and I own those prototypes, and I'd love to make them one day. Um, and um, it's called Defenders of Storm. And, and what uh, scale did you say they were gonna be? They're one six, actually. They're basically an original line of Hot Toys style uh, figures. But, uh, but we have a lot of it in digital. We, we, we have a lot of it in digital form because we scanned a lot of the pieces. Uh, most of it was sculpted in, in wax though by David. Um, so yeah, I mean, you know, it's funny. I hadn't thought about that line in, in two years uh, until <laughs> you think of it. I forgot that I still own it. Uh, Maybe one day. I mean, you never know if somebody's willing to, to fund it. I just, you know, to fund something like that is just so expensive. Uh, I mean, like I said, pe I see people go to Kickstarter and what's it called again? Defenders of Storm. Defenders of Storm? Storm is the, the planet that the characters exist on. Uh, and they're obviously defending it. Um, it's, 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 it's designed to be kid-friendly, but but still adult friendly, you know, it's kind of in the middle there, a little Star Warsy in that sense. It's not, you know, it's not like really dark and gritty. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's, I guess it's also inspired by Masters of the Universe in that, in that way too, because Masters kind of walks that line, I think. All right. Well, I, I think I've taken up more than enough of your time today. I once again want to thank you for sitting down with us and talking about all this stuff. Yeah, look forward to maybe you getting back into things at some point. Um, who knows? Yeah, I mean, you really never know. I, I didn't think I would after soda, so you just never know. But I really appreciate this interview, too, um, and thank you for, for the time. Okay, so that was it. Once again, I just want to thank Jerry for sitting down and talking with us, and thank you guys for watching the video. It was another long one. 
but I did feel like there was a lot of interesting information in there, especially if you're really kind of interested in seeing how the toy industry works behind the scenes. It's really not something that we often get a, a, a real look at. So again, I hope you guys did enjoy this video. And if you did, please like this video, subscribe to the channel. And if you're so inclined uh, to go the extra mile, you know, please feel free to, you know, pass it around on your social media feeds. I, I do really appreciate the help. And until next time, guys, I'll catch you later. Hey, thanks for watching today's video. And be sure to subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. And hit that bell notification to alert it every time I upload a new video. And be sure to head over to the Toy News International and Marvelous News Message Sports Communities. It's a great place to talk toys and win cool contests like $100 store credits to Big Bad Toy Store. And remember, action figures are great.